Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. It's 14 degrees. It's dark. It's cloudy. And it's August. Marcus, how in the world are we in August in the UK with this kind of weather? What the heck is going on? Well, we're in London, so the cloudy skies are maybe not the worst you've ever seen in all these years. However, yeah, it's not really... Ugh, I don't know, man. It's grey. It's grey, that's all I can say. I know, but but you know what? The thing that makes it better is we had a really great guest today. Who's on the show? Yeah, so... All the way from the U.S., we had Lars Schmidt with us and his book, Redefining HR, which is a very comprehensive look at the future of HR. A lot of detail, a lot of things, a lot about people, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we had a lot of detailed conversations. And therefore, I rather quickly go into what were your takeaways. Well, as I told you during one of our kind of pre-recording discussions, I'm not a huge fan of HR. I mean, for all the years I've been around, HR didn't stand for human resources. It stood for human remains. I mean, the only point was to hire people, to keep executives out of jail, and to make it easier to fire people. So he does indeed give some really good insights on what the future of HR looks like, how it's being transformed. And I was really glad to hear kind of some of his takes. And of course, human remains. He says, yeah, that makes great fodder for sitcoms and for movies. Which because it's a it's a perfectly valid stereotype. Um, the other one was taking it to the other extreme. We talked about teal organizations, self managing teams. Can we actually take the HR people away and leave the value that HR brings to the organization? I mean, he has a really interesting view that it's it's not going to be a hundred percent wholesale replacement, but organizations can move a long way through understanding how to communicate purpose and vision and mission and do a lot of the things that HR currently does, but it can't do it all. Those are my takeaways. What about you? Yeah, so I have to deal a lot with, and I really actually am curious about talent. So talent and the skills people have, the skills people learn. You know, I work a lot in change and transformation, which is all about always new skills, new skills, new skills, who can learn it, who can't. Who do I have to fire if really, really needed? And who can come on board early, later, eventually? It's a massive question for organizations because a lot of organizations are digitally and process and generally so behind with a lot, a lot of things. So they need new people who can do new things. And often, I think, so in this case, what we talked about, and I really enjoyed that, was the actual connection between transformation, where I work, and his view on how HR can contribute to unlocking and saying, hey, organizations, you actually have a lot of people sitting there who have those skills. You just have to give them the chance to do so. Or improving it vastly by just having a no-nonsense job description and actually not having the problem of promising a lot and then after someone's onboarded, the reality in the organization looks so different that people are just jumping off the wagon as quickly. Because we're now living in post-COVID, The job market has changed massively. There are a lot of people out there who are trying to find new jobs. But at the same time, people just realized not every job is actually worth my time and my health. So I'm going to think twice now before I really fully engage and join with an organization. And those are a lot of intricacies that I think organizations have to be really, really aware of Mm -hmm. and really, really focus more on people. And as we just discussed pre this five minutes recording is Someone will have to pick up this people and humanity thing, bring it back to organizations. HR, I think, can contribute. Who, in the end, will sort of settle around actually representing it in companies, or will it be a thing that everyone picks up a little bit? I don't know. But it's definitely something that's worth looking at and for organizations to adopt in some way or another. And uh, speaking of looking at, they're going to look at our audience being, they're going to look at your background. They're going to look at Lars's background. (laughs) They're going to realize that you're both skater boys and I'm not. But rather than talking about skater boys, let's go talk to, let's go talk to Lars. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. 
We use Zencaster for all our audio and video recording. And it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels for very easy editing. Zencaster is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat, Wicked Podcast for 40% off. And now the interview. Hello, everyone. Today we're here with Lars Schmidt. Hello, Lars. How are you doing? And thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, doing well and uh, looking forward to the chat. Super. So as usual, we start at the top. So please tell our audience who you are and why you wrote the book. Yeah, so I'm uh, Mars Schmidt. I'm a dad, husband, entrepreneur, podcaster. Uh, do a lot of different stuff kind of at my core. Uh, I try to get involved in projects that accelerate innovation in HR, and that's what led me to write uh, Redefining HR. Cool. And is it your first book? Uh, it is not. It's my first solo book. I co-authored uh, Employer Branding for Dummies uh, with Richard Mosley on Wiley uh, back in 2017. So that was my first, uh, technically my first book, um, but it was a co-author. Uh, and obviously that format is very, uh, you know, programmed and structured. So this is my first, uh, you know, independent freeform book. Um, yeah. Right. So <clears throat> let's, let's start off with the fact that I am an HR skeptic. <laughs> I, I find that HR doesn't stand for human resources. Typically, it stands for human remains. The mm. idea of HR is to hire people, to ensure that leaders don't wind up going to jail, and to make it easier to fire people. And that's probably a very outdated version of HR. Tell us how HR is changing and how fast it's changing. Yeah, I mean, so look, what you're describing is uh, is a pretty, you know, uh, hard to argue with snapshot of legacy HR. You know, there are certainly HR teams that, um, you know, operated that way in the past. There's HR teams that still operate that way. I, my focus uh, and kind of my network has really been on the leading edge of HR, um, the kind of modern wing of the function, which is a, a smaller subset, but it's growing, especially given the last 18 months and what we've been through. It's been a kind of a springboard in that direction. You know, modern HR teams are, are very different. They're proactive versus reactive. They're uh, strategic versus administrative. Um, they're, they're business functions focused on people as opposed to kind of uh, administrative or bureaucratic functions focusing on compliance, uh, right? And so there's a pretty big delta between the way that leading teams think, operate, and support both the business and employees, you know, versus those legacy teams that you describe that, you know, are, are the, are stereotypes, uh, frankly, uh, and, and, and good fodder for movies and TV shows, but you know, <laughs> doesn't represent the, uh, the leading edge of the field today. Yeah. One of, one of the quotes that I loved in that particular section of your book, when you're laying out, as you say, the legacy bit was too many times people ask, why is HR here? And I, I thought it was always kind of a, a great question. And to see the evolution, to see HR being embraced, being part of the discussion and being recognized as adding value is is, is really good. So uh, well done for kind of moving the field forward. But I have to say, you've got quite an uphill battle, I think. Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't argue against that. I think that uh, lots of people, their perceptions of HR is based on the HR they've experienced. And so if you haven't worked in one of those environments that is more of a progressive organization, um, does create more, much more uh, programs for employees uh, and with employees, frankly, co-creating. Um, you know, you, you may feel that way and you're certainly entitled to that opinion because you haven't seen anything else. Uh, and so I think you have to work in that environment. You have to work with those kinds of people teams to change that perception. Um, and until you do, you won't. And that's fair. Yeah. And um, in the area where we work, uh, which is a lot of change and transformation slash innovation at times, you know, there is a lot of change, a lot of new things being brought to organizations as well. A lot of things are changing in just so many areas where HR definitely can play a role. And uh, so, you know, for me, for example, there's a lot of talk about customer experience and colleague experience. And you talk about employee experience. Can you tell us mm -hmm. a bit more about what that is, please? Yeah, I mean, employee experience is really, um, it's it's a broad term that and it applies to anything that an employee experiences in the workplace from their, um, you know, the physical setup of their office back when we did those to, uh, you know, to their benefits, um, to their developmental programs, to training, um, you know, pay and promotions. You know, there, there's some practitioners that actually 
use employee experience instead of HR. Um, you know, they, the HR to them is a data term. They talk more about employee experience. There's other people who use employee experience as a subset of HR. So it's actually one of those terms, even within the field, that we don't have a consistent definition for. Um, I tend to look at it as a subset of the broader kind of HR and or people ops, however you want to look at that. Um, but yeah, I think it, it speaks to, you know, all of the different things that an employee, uh, you know, will, will experience in their role. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting because, you know, with service design and other parts, often, you know, you talk to change management or you look at the processes that actually the internal people are having on products and services and all sorts, really. And it feels quite similar. Maybe there's overlaps, maybe there's not. But one one thing I really wanted to ask about, because it's just one of those thorns, and I'll probably say that because I work um, a lot as a freelance consultant. So I'm on and off a lot of organizations and I like it. However, onboarding is one of those things that in particular, and I can imagine that's the same for permanent employees, you know, the crucial time when you have your first experience with an organization should be very, very positive, should be absolutely right, smooth and whatnot. Why is onboarding often so bad? Yeah, you know, look, I think companies don't prioritize onboarding nearly as much as they should, especially now, right? I think onboarding, you know, collectively, We've always been pretty average out. Some companies have been terrible. Some companies have really uh, put a lot of thought into it. And I think those tend to create uh, what I call stickier hires, right? People that are more likely to get in, have a great onboarding experience. There's lots of statistics that speak about um, the quality of the onboarding experience directly impacting the length of retention uh, and level of engagement of employees. And you know, when you think about it, changing jobs is a big emotional life event, right? And if you're not onboarded well in the organization, you're, you're, you know, it, it's hard to be as excited about that new chapter in your life. And I think that it's only been magnified now, you know, we're in this environment where, you know, many organizations are hiring people remotely. Um, they've never met them in person. There's no chemistry with a hiring manager because all of the interviews have been via Zoom, uh, video conference. And so, you know, that is already uh, extra kind of lonely and isolating. And so if you're not g going above and beyond from an, from an onboarding perspective and even a pre-boarding perspective, the period of time between when they accept an offer and when they actually start, like that's when onboarding really begins. And so if you're not really prioritizing that and, and you know, creating a, an experience to really get people hooked early, chances are they're not going to be that, you know, that firm in the role. And especially now, it's just such a weird talent market where um, hiring is off the charts, uh, you know, in, in, in most jobs, right? And so especially for on-demand talent, tech talent, sales, go-to-market, engineering, et cetera. And so, you know, even if you hire somebody and they're in that onboarding period, if they don't feel wanted, if they don't feel informed, if they don't feel engaged, those other companies aren't going to stop recruiting them. So, you know, chances are I've, I've definitely seen many more candidates because uh, I, you know, one of my facets of my business is executive recruiting um, who are in that onboarding period, that three month period. And they're still willing to talk to me because what they were kind of sold uh, in the interview process isn't matching what they're experiencing. Right. And so they would rather just, you know, if, if that writing is on the wall, and it's pretty clear that it was a bait and switch or it's not the same environment. They would rather just pull the plug now and move on to something else, then wait and like have that, you know, those negative feelings continue to be reinforced uh, beyond the onboarding period. Yeah. And if they've, if they've never actually met you face to face, if it's been totally virtual, the, the disconnect is less painful than if you actually build a relationship with someone. So the, the get out, I think is easier. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the, the level of um, connection, trust, rapport, uh, it's just, it's not going to be there the same way it would if you've had several meetings with that person, if you've had a meal with that person, it's just a different experience. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Just, just to so, stick maybe one round. Sorry, you're there. Go on. Just to stick a little bit longer around that particular subject matter, because the couple of weeks ago, I had a question in my head where I was looking exactly at the same thing. I was just onboarding on a new project. And I was like, why is this such a pain? Why is there no, exactly, why is there no business focus on, on towards value on that? Because for the longest time, I think a lot of companies realize that, you know, the people costs are significant. If the people costs are significant, and if talent, acquiring talent, is one of the highest priorities on most CEOs list, why is it still perceived as such a low 
value. And I was just talking to a friend of mine as well, who's now starting at some company. He says like, yeah, you know what? I'll give it a go. Um, it looks quite great and everything around it is great, but I'm still giving it just a 50-50. And I'm like, really? That's how bad it is in a, in a way that, you know, you're being just disappointed by the onboarding and what happens after so often that it's still such a bad experience or such a gamble. And you have a lot of case studies of um, from HR professionals or various pieces in your book. It's really great to read. And um, do you have sort of an example of that where HR is doing a better job in this, sort of some of examples, maybe some stories or where these things just work better and or where people shifted the focus on that like a lot of organizations are now starting to shift focus on sustainability and hooking incentives towards it. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that the, uh, I mean, let's be honest that the bar is pretty low, yeah. um, from expectations. Like it doesn't take that much to, to wow somebody and to, to make a really positive first experience just because so few companies do. And so if you really invest in that, uh, and it's, when I say invest, I don't mean like putting tons of money towards it, just time being intentional, uh, being thoughtful, uh, it can make a huge difference. And so one of the things I think you're starting to see now is um, some companies are, are leveraging tools to actually help support and automate some of that engagement. Um, and so, you know, from a, from a practice standpoint, you know, there are tools out there that you can kind of map out the entire uh, employee pre-boarding and onboarding journey and trigger certain uh, notifications to either the, the new hire uh, the hiring manager, the hiring team, the recruiter, whatever stakeholders you want to configure to, that will kind of prompt them, hey, follow up at this point. Hey, send this uh, welcome video from a CEO at this point. You know, Send these uh, FAQs on how to sign up for your benefits and how to register for this system and that system at this point. Like There, there are tools out there that you can automate that and they're not that expensive. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so to me, like, there's no real excuse to not get that part right. Uh, it just requires um, being deliberate and intentional about it. You know, maybe invest a little bit of money in tools. But again, if you can automate things, which you can, it takes that burden off of you as a recruiter or a hiring manager or whoever to be like, oh, I've got to remember to do this for this person. Like, no, you just, you set it, you configure it, and you're able to kind of maintain that level of engagement. Um, even if it's not you physically sitting, hitting send on the keyboard, it doesn't matter to the new hire if they're getting that welcome video, if they're getting that um, uh, uh, org chart to look at for their new team, if they're getting uh, a breakdown of the different groups that they're going to work with or the systems they need to know or the logins they need right on day one. So they're not sitting there wondering like, how do I log into this thing that I have to go to get all my information, right? Like that, that, that is not hard to do. You just have to have the desire to do it. And, um, you know, that's what I think we're seeing more of, but we certainly need to get better. Absolutely. I think, you know, I, I remember one project, which was a transformation project where we had to build everything from scratch, but our onboarding thing was just a big Trello board with a couple of documents and people's names on it. And that made such a difference because we could just have someone sit there for two days work work his or her way through it and you know in the end they would actually feel quite comfortable because they knew who to talk to they got a fairly good overview of the project and so on and just took a trello board really you know you can do that on teams or whatever absolutely yeah, yeah. so that's when it works well but what about this whole new generation of millennials who believe in value authenticity and they also have this huge sense of entitlement how do they kind of respond to the fact that, oh, yes, I've just been added to the automation automation of the process of, of, of onboarding? Because whether it's true or not, we read a lot about this millennial entitlement. I've graduated. I now want to be vice president and deciding everything on day two. And I want everything to be personal. I want everything about personal training for me, my personal development. Oh, yeah, you're the company, but, but it's all about me. How do you deal with Either A, is that real? Or B, how do you deal with it if it is? Yeah, I mean, so I'd react in a couple of ways. One, I mean, I, I tend to think generational stereotypes are overblown. Uh, and frankly, in HR, they're kind of lazy thinking, right? Like I'm, I'm Gen X and it's like, well, boomers did this and Gen X did this and millennials want this. And, you know, Gen Z now wants this. It's like, I want some of those things. I don't want some of those other things. Like I think that it's, uh, you know, we, we tend to, use generational brushes uh, uh, sometimes to just kind of lump people together. And, and I don't necessarily 
um, you know, subscribe to that because I, I just don't, I don't, I don't see it. I think it's, 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 you know, it's just not, it doesn't really conform necessarily to the, to the, to what I've experienced or what I've seen in different groups. Um, I do think in terms of like using those tools from a personalization standpoint, to be honest, like, how do they know that that isn't somebody actually sitting there sending that to them? Right. It's not like it says like, dear sir or madam, welcome to Acme company in job X, right? It's like, it's personalized. It has their name. It has their title. Like you can put in, you know, uh, figures in there so it can import in like, okay, this, it knows that this person's hiring manager is Jane Doe and their job is software engineer and they're going to be based in Lisbon uh, or whatever it may be. And so it can configure and customize based on that. Um, so I think, I think, you know, you do need to do that. Like, I think, and again, like I would be, I, you know, I'm not, you know, a millennial, but if I got a boilerplate, like dear sir, uh, <laughs> you know, congratulations on your job, you know, I'd be like, Oh, well, great. Like, thanks for a lot. But I think you can customize that enough through those tools that it does feel, uh, like, you know, uh, personalized enough that it has that personal touch, um, without feeling like it's just kind of a robot, you know, spitting out, you know, form letter. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of, uh, my couple of years in advertising when advertising with brands tried really, really hard to talk to, you know, younger people of sorts and yeah. just started to really embarrass themselves instead of just being authentic <laughs> about it. Um, uh, one of the really smaller lines, or you, you got to list some of the kind of things that are sort of a bit of a don'ts, uh, for the future. So somewhere you say a band culture fit. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that a bit, please? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, especially in the Bay Area, I do a lot of work in, in tech and kind of venture back companies. And, um, you know, the, the term culture fit, um, you know, became something that every it was just the, the, the on trend level was off the charts, right? Everybody talked about culture fit. Oh, I got to build culture fit. And I don't know about this person. They're not a good culture fit and blah, 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 blah. And I think it got to a point where the, the idea of culture fit became weaponized in some organizations, not all of them. You know, culture is important. So I'm, you have to separate the concept of culture and the term culture fit, right? So set culture conversations aside, because I do think that's important and it matters. But culture fit, that is something that I think a lot of people have just used to weed out people who don't look like them, think like them, went to the same schools they went to, like the same music they went to, uh, and it became an exclusionary term. And so I think a lot of people would use that to say, well, I don't know if we should hire that person. They're not a good culture fit. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, tell, tell me what that means. Like, and so my, my, you know, argument in the book, and I, I wrote a fast company on this piece on this called the end of culture fit, I think in 2017, where I'm just like, you know, you, you have to press back on that. You can't allow someone to just say, uh, I, I'm not, I'm going to pass on this candidate because they're not a good culture fit. What does that mean specifically break that down? And if you can't, then that's not, then that's not valid. Um, right. And so I think that, uh, I, I think that's the pushback when you have people that, um, you know, it's kind of like the contest, uh, you know, back you know, similar to those days, you'd have people use the analogy of like, oh, it's not really somebody that I'd, I'd want to go to a bar with, you know, and go drinking with. Well, why does it have to be like, again, the whole idea of, you know, diversity of experiences and background and thought and, and ideology, uh, you know, if, if you're, if your quality for hiring is sameness, what do you expect to get? Like, what kind of monolithic culture are you going to create in that? So I think, I think it is important to just, you know, it's a term that just no longer adds any value. It's just kind of a cliche at this point. So, um, you know, in that, in the story in past company, I highlighted a few companies that just banned that term outright. And they talk about things like uh, either culture add or values fit. And, you know, values, I think that's something specific that you can actually, uh, you know, engineer an interview process to understand uh, but culture is just a more of a nebulous thing. And when you say culture fit, uh, to me, it just doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And I think uh, for me, it's just, uh, you know, looking at creativity and innovation, it's just so absolutely uh, pivotal in terms of you want to have cross-disciplinary, you want to have different viewpoints. And it's really not helping having someone that just fits in because then you're just having another drone on the factory floor, so to speak. And oddly enough, literally no one no one needs that anymore so i really really uh i don't understand why why some companies are still looking for that but i would expand that even to a point where um if you look at role descriptions and the way people are hiring right there's a lot of things where certain things there's a list of things required and i've probably barely been in a job where 
all of these things actually ended up being required. And then suddenly they asked for something different. Yeah. So let's talk about hiring and a little bit how HR can help and influence sort of that not just diversity is hired, but sort of the right people are hired, the right talent that actually can adopt or can bring the right value and outcome to it rather than just a bunch of skill sets. Yeah. I mean, like job descriptions suck. Um, let's just start there. I mean, most job descriptions are retreads from the last time you hired that person. Um, it's, it's a laundry list of responsibilities and a laundry list of uh, either unrealistic or in some cases, unre- you know, non-relevant uh, qualifications. And so, you know, if you look at how recruiting has happened, you know, it's interesting, like we, we've made so many advances in technology and, and society and trends yet, you know, for the most part, we're still hiring like we did 20 years ago with a resume and a job description. We're just not faxing them anymore. You know, where we have online applicant tracking systems or, uh, you know, emails to kind of capture the information electronically, but more or less, it hasn't changed that much. Um, And so I think that, you know, when you look at writing job descriptions, um, you know, I always challenge hiring managers to write it from scratch, you know, never revisit an old job description and focus more on outcomes, right? Like if this person is successful, what are the things they'll actually be doing? Not like, you know, building widgets X, Y, Z, but like, what does building widgets mean for the business? How does that impact the business? And then from a qualification standpoint, you know, keep those light and really make them like, do they absolutely have to have this? Like, oh, you know, college degree. Do they really need a college degree? Do they really need to have a degree in marketing to be able to do this job? The answer is no, right? They don't need that. If it's a specialized job, sure. But, you know, for core jobs, no. Um, When you look at years of experience, like I think it's important for hiring managers and recruiters to really, you know, scrutinize those with the intent of removing some of those bullets rather than adding to them and determining like, is this really, uh, you know, necessary and additive to the role? So that that's kind of the first baseline, um, you know, review of the job description itself. The second one is like stripping out a lot of the, the hyperbole and, you know, useless buzzwords that we put in there, you know, rock stars and A plus players and like, that, that's all nonsense. Uh, and actually statistically, that's been shown to um, discourage, um, you know, more underrepresented candidate pools uh, and, and females um, for that matter. And so, you know, if you want to build an inclusive job description, that's going to get you the broadest inclusive um, pool of applicants. You've got to really be mindful of what you're saying, what words you're using um, and how you're framing that job. So, yeah, I mean that, you know, we could, we could spend an hour on job descriptions. It's a topic that I'm, I'm certainly passionate about primarily because like we've just, uh, we've not, you know, we've involved innovated in a lot of different ways. Um, job descriptions is not one of them. Okay. So, Let's look at the other side of that particular coin. You've written a job description. You've put your heart and soul into it. You've now got a thousand applicants and you need the criteria that is universal, not subject to any claims of discrimination to eliminate as many of those people as possible to get down to the five or 10 that are roughly equal. And then you can actually make a a judgment call on that. But in that pool of the ones that you eliminated, are these crazy outliers that for some reason didn't hit one of those triggers that was easy to exclude. How do you balance the, I want the outlier that my business really needs versus this mass processing of applications? Uh, You know, in an environment like that, with that kind of a number, I mean, a thousand applicants for one job is, is, would be pretty atypical. I think the average is. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. Yeah, but that's cool. But it's, you know, it's to illustrate a point. I I think the average last statistic I've seen is, is about 200 applicants, uh, you know, on a given job, which is still not insignificant. And some certainly get up to a thousand. Um, Look, I I think to be honest, like, I don't have a great answer there. I think for the most part, when you look at um, how recruiting happens, it's still a human reviewing a uh, oftentimes a marginally written resume that's more of a, a, a retrospective look back at things that you've done, not necessarily things you want to do. Uh, you know, pairing that with a poorly written job description that's often an overly dense uh, you know, summary of, of responsibilities and qualifications, and then a human making that alignment decision, whether it's a recruiter or a hiring manager, like that's that's wickedly inefficient. And it has been. And again, that's the same way we did things 20 years ago before the internet even existed. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential. You're starting to see some new AI based tools that actually, um, you know, will pull 
Uh, they, they can do uh, assessments like online assessments coupled with resumes and backgrounds and through their uh, algorithm identify traits and experiences that actually overlap with the profile for a role. Um, so it may help you identify and source people who on paper, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, that person actually could do that. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of potential in those types of tools. I think we're years away for them being you know, really kind of broadly adopted and impactful and, 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 you know, also having some of the biases that are programmed into the AI, you know, removed from that. Cause that also, you know, again, humans are programmed in the AI. So they're um, it's inheriting some of those own, some of that bias as well. Um, but I think until we have that, we're still going to have this inefficient system where we're not going to be able to consistently be able to identify those outliers uh, especially at a volume like you're, you know, presenting, that's just, that, that's just not going to happen. Right. Or, so, or someone will get lucky or someone will get, but luck, luck is a strategy. So that, uh, that's, that, that's not really repeatable. Maybe, maybe there's a business opportunity in there somewhere. I, then, I think, I think there's a few companies trying to go after that right now, the AI space, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how they yeah. uh, develop over time. Uh, we're in this situation that we always find ourselves where we've got more questions than we have time. So I've got one last question for you, and it's, I think it's a provocative question. Have you heard of Teal organizations? They're intended to be self-managing organizations where all the people kind of manage themselves, where they all decide exactly what they need to be doing on a day in and day out basis. Part of what I took from your book was that the vision of HR in the future is to be more about managing and running organizations and keeping the things kind of pulled together as a cultural fit. And that seems almost like a proxy for the leadership and their ability to communicate purpose and vision and mission and act on behalf. Do you think we could ever evolve to a point where HR becomes embedded in teams as a process instead of needing dedicated people to do the HR work? Um, so I would probably meet you halfway in that one, I don't know that we will see uh, a time when all of the capabilities and thinking and, and background of HR is completely integrated into teams at a team level so that HR would not need to exist. What I do think is, and this is part of the, we talk about, you know, a lot of the, the book gets into the compare and contrast between legacy HR and modern HR. One of the biggest shifts is legacy HR was all about command and control. Uh, right, they kind of, they traded these uh, these power structures uh, in hierarchies where they felt that if everything flowed through HR, it was a pathway to power, right? And it gave them more clout and credibility, but it didn't. It pissed off the employees. It made them seem bloated and bureaucratic and red tape and all the administrative stuff that you're mentioning. Uh, you know, human remains, like those types of things, I think are, are part of that that legacy. I think when you look at modern HR teams, their default is more decentralized and empowered. They don't want to be in charge of everything. They don't want to be the, the gatekeepers on anything, right? They want that to be pushed down to the department level and the team level. They want to be there to support the teams and they want to be able to create the frameworks through which the teams can work under, um, but not about kind of managing every aspect of everything that happens um, in the employee life cycle. So that's, you know, I, I think that is, it's, it's probably a middle ground. I don't think, I don't necessarily see a scenario where, that's entirely embedded into the organizations and they're completely autonomous without any HR whatsoever. But I do think that there are leaner, more strategically focused HR teams, um, but they see their views as more as enablers of the business um, and, and supporters of those leaders so that they can lead and they can manage um, versus kind of the, the gatekeeper trying to control and, 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 you know, have authority over everything. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break slightly with the protocol and I'm going to have another last question because uh, this is really fun. Um, there's just so much in the book uh, that's also really, really relevant when you work in change and transformation where a lot of talent's required and things are shifting all over the place. It's a massive, massive people challenge. Um, so we had, we had a couple of weeks back, we had Jeff Schwartz on the, um, um, on the podcast and he was talking about one of the... Um, uh, researched it over in the human capital at Deloitte, and he's saying one of one of the stats he brought back was leadership totally underestimates how much employees actually want to learn and change and bring themselves into uh, their job. So the percentage was just 
there was a massive delta there between what leadership thought and when they asked the employees, they would totally be on board. And that's a constant problem for change and transformation to go, well, we're going to have X amount of percent of people who are just not going to be with us through this. That's a thing. And I've seen, as you mentioned earlier, when we were trying to identify skill sets of people, we were always surprised how wrong the data was when we actually worked with people, what they were capable of doing. In maybe just a few sentences, um, how, how can HR contribute to exactly that, showing that there is a multitude, if not a polymathic sometimes, opportunity in people who are already working for you? So the, the, hidden, the hidden value of people in organizations, um, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think organizations of a certain size, and I don't know necessarily what the, I don't think there's a formula for what size threshold that would be. Um, they need to be able to be focused on internal mobility and internal development um, as a tool. Like we're all, you know, hearing about the great resignation and, and uh, you know, those numbers are real. Uh, I think part of it is because people don't necessarily see other opportunities to grow and develop and, and utilize their skills within an organization. And so his, part of this is historical, you know, we're used to very structured jobs, siloed teams, you come in as a widget builder, you're gonna build widgets. Um, I think this new, as we're moving into this new world that's really based uh, largely on flexibility and adaptability and agility in our workforce, that means we've gotta do a much better job at uh, you know, creating more fluid momentum within our businesses and organizations for talent um, to move laterally and vertically, um, some cases maybe a step back to take two steps forward. Um, but we haven't done a great job of that historically. Uh, and for those of us that don't do that, it's going to become even harder to hold on to talent. So I think as more companies try to you know, get ahead of the great resignation, that'll be one of the things they'll be doing is figuring out how they can redeploy uh, and develop their own internal teams uh, because we spend so much time and effort recruiting them uh, we're not matching that with retention, and this is a huge piece for retention. Absolutely. Wonderful. Great last words on this one, uh, Lars. Thank you so much for your time. We could talk to you for hours for sure. Thanks for all the insights and for being with us. Yeah, well, I appreciate the, uh, the chat and uh, really enjoy the conversation. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com. 